Turn with me to start tonight in First Peter chapter four. We'll do a little a little background. As we move into these next these next few chapters, I talked about last week, 25 through 32, or, or uh, uh, Ezekiel's shifted his uh, what he's talk who he's talking to now. That, and remember, in uh, last chapter 24, he declared that he was going to be dumb again, which means it means he's not going to speak. It means he's not going to he stopped talking to the nation of Israel now for the time being until until he hears in chapter 33. In about 18 months, in his future, that the temple is destroyed. Once he hears that the temple and the city is destroyed, then he can he goes back to talking to the nation of Israel again, and he shifts gears again at that time because from that point on, then it's all about restoration and not because the the destruction is all over with by that point. But in chapters 25 through 32. He is uh, actually talking to the nations that surround Israel, the, the, the Gentile nations. And there's seven of them. And we're, we're going to go through we we'll go through each, each one of those. And, but I want to start out here in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and read uh, very familiar scriptures. It should be for everybody. Verse 17 and 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now Peter said it's time that judgment has to start. He says several things there. Number one, it's time for judgment. Judgment has to start. And judgment has to. They don't have any choice. It has to begin at the house of God. Because we are God's chosen people. Israel was God's chosen people. We are the bride. We are the church. It applies to the church. It applies to Israel. Both under 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 both of our separate covenants that we have, the understanding with God. Judgment will always begin with his people, with his chosen ones. And Peter said it's time. It's time and it's time for judgment to begin at the house of God. Look at Proverbs uh, chapter 11. I'll read two or three scriptures here. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 31 says, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. If God's going to judge us, if he's going to judge his own people, be most assured that he's going to judge the sinner, the ungodly, and the wicked. And that's what that's what this, these upcoming chapters are about because he's judging these nations. He's having, Ezekiel is not prophesying to these nations in these next chapters that we're going to go through in such a way as uh, if you change your ways, then everything will be okay. That's not the kind of prophecy. He, what, what he's actually telling them is that here's what's going to happen. You're going to be judged. Here's why. Period. He's not really He's not give, really giving them any choice because this is coming from a long standing time of them coming against the nation of Israel, not helping them, having everything, doing everything against them and actually laughing and rejoicing and having a good time at seeing the destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple because he's talking to them in the present as if the future that he's telling them about has already happened, if that makes sense, if you understand what I'm saying. Because what he's saying, he's talking to them in prophecy, and he's talking to them in such a way that what he's saying has already happened. It's a done deal, in other words. Nothing's going to change. None of this is going to change. And, and God will judge his people, us. He will judge us. If he'll correct us, he will most assuredly correct the ungodly and the unrighteous and the sinner. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, Verse 
29 says, For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For if I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts, therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth, the righteous and the unrighteous. But it's time for judgment. It's time for the judgment to begin. We're getting, we're getting to the point where the day is coming. This prophecy in, in chapter 24 is starting out. We're 18 months away from the destruction of the temple. He knows it's time. It's time. It's getting close to time. And, and God has changed his gears, and now he's speaking out to the surrounding nations that surround him. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 9, and I'll read a few verses from there. We've already, we've already went through that. Ezekiel chapter 9, starting in verse 2. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. That's where he said to start. Start at the house of God. Begin at the sanctuary. He told these men, he said, go through and mark the head of the very few, the remnant that is always going to be left behind. There's always going to be a remnant saved out from the mass of the people, from destruction, from judgment. There's always going to be a remnant left over. And he said, go through and mark these heads, mark the foreheads of these men that, that are actually upset because of what's happened in Jerusalem. And there's very few of them because they weren't gone very long. They were back real quick. And they said, we're all done. We found them all. And God said, start at the sanctuary. Judgment starts at the sanctuary, at the house of God. Notice he's already left off the cherub, and he's sitting on the, on the threshold of the house because he's fixing to leave there and go to the east gate. Why? Because he can't stand, he can't be around this blood. He, 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 he's got to get, he's clearing out of the city. He's clearing out, and he's telling them. This is a future prophecy that Ezekiel told them. He said, start at the sanctuary and kill everybody. Don't leave anybody alive that don't have the mark. Don't leave anybody alive that's not covered by the mark that I place on them. Does that sound familiar? Don't leave anybody alive that ain't covered in the blood. Don't leave anybody alive that don't have blood on the doorpost, he told them in the days of the Passover. Paul said, if we're hid in Christ, the death can't come to us. We're hid. We're in Christ. In Christ. In the blood. Under the blood. Under the mark. We're marked and set aside. They were marked and they were set aside. There was a remnant. There was a few of them. And he told these angels to go and kill everybody else. Don't spare. Don't have no pity on anybody. Don't do anything. But the point I'm trying to make is start at the sanctuary. It has to start at the house of God. Now back to Ezekiel. 25. <clears throat> I want to read, uh, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read a few scriptures in Jeremiah 27 before we start. Because this, pro this prophecy, Jeremiah is speaking the same thing that we're going to read in, the, in, in chapter 25 of Ezekiel and on through. 
uh, chapter 32. Uh, Jeremiah 27 and verse 2. Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck, and send them to the king of Edom, and to the king of Moab, and to the king of the Ammonites, and to the king of Tyrus, and to the king of Zidon, by the hand of the messengers which came to Jerusalem unto Zedekiah, the king of Judah, Zedekiah, the king of Judah. And command them to say unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say unto your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast, that are upon the ground, by my great power, and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed meet to me. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beast of the field have I given him to serve him, and all nations shall serve him, and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of this land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom which shall not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword, and with the famine, and with the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. Now remember, Jeremiah, during the captivity, is in Jerusalem. It's imperative that we remember all these things. Ezekiel is in Babylon. He's already been carried away. Now, <clears throat> these nations, these seven nations that we're going to read about in the next few chapters, do not include Babylon. They don't include Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and, and these nations that have come against Israel. They're left completely out. They're, they're, they're not on this list. And there's a couple of reasons for that, in my opinion. Number one, remember Daniel. At the same time, this is all going on. Remember Daniel. Daniel don't tell us that Daniel and Ezekiel are living in Babylon at about the same time. They're there together. And when you go and you read Daniel, Daniel don't talk about, he don't prophesy to the nation of Israel the things the way Ezekiel does. And Ezekiel don't, Ezekiel don't mention Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't read nothing in Ezekiel about Nebuchadnezzar building a statue and making everybody on the face of the earth bow down. To the, we don't read any of that. But they're there at the same time. They have to be there. They have to be together. It had to be in there somehow. They had to be, you know, they had to cross paths at some point in time. And, and number two, Babylon, for the time being, Nebuchadnezzar is being called the servant of the Most High God. Right now, he is the rod of justice and the rod of judgment on the earth. He is what God is using to judge the rest of the earth. So Babylon don't fall into this category of these nations that he's going to speak to. That he's, going to, speak to. It's, it's, he's, he's not in there. But J Jeremiah is talking to the same people. He's talking to the, to the nation of Israel in Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem. Ezekiel and Daniel are both in Babylon. We have to keep have to keep all the stuff in, in our heads. Try to. It's hard for me to keep it in my head. I, I to, maybe I think because I have to remind myself so much that I need to remind y'all. Maybe I don't need to remind y'all. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, Ezekiel 25 is, is, is our chapter for tonight. Let's start in verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against the Ammonites, and prophesy against them, and say unto the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, Because thou saidst, Aha, against my sanctuary, when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel, when it was, when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah, when they went into captivity. Behold, therefore, I will deliver thee to the men of the east, or to the Nebuchadnezzar's armies, for a possession, and they shall set their palaces in thee, and make their dwellings in thee. They shall eat thy fruit, and they shall drink thy milk. And I will make Rabbah a stable for camels, and the Ammonites a couching place for flocks. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast clapped thine hands, and stamped thy feet, and rejoiced in heart with all thy despite, with all thy despite against the land of Israel. Behold, therefore, I will stretch out my hand upon thee, and will deliver thee for a spoil to the heathen, and I will cut thee off from the people. And I will cause thee to perish out of the countries. I will destroy thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Now, these nations, I, I only had one picture to share, so I didn't bring the, 
I didn't set up the thing tonight, but this is, you can pass this around in a minute, but this is Israel here, of course, and these kingdoms, that, these nations that we're talking about, we've got the Edomites down here, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. These are all in Jordan, what's known as Jordan now, and the Philistines, little bitty tiny, the red there in the Philistines, and this is this is Israel. These are the nations, this and where they're located, that were going to be that all in, are in this chapter that are covered in this chapter. Because of the seven of the seven nations that he prophesies against, the first the the, all, all the first four these there's four in in uh, chapter 25, and in chapter 26, 27, 28, three chapters are dedicated to the king of Tyre or to the, 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 the city of Tyre, Tyrus. And then 29 through 32 is all dedicated to Egypt. So Tyre and, and Egypt get a lot more coverage than these four do. Although these four are all ancient enemies of the nation of Israel. And when this happened, when this took place, when, when, when this was done, the, it, says, it, it says all through here that all of these are going to be made they're, they're going to be done away with. They're going to go away with. One, one of these is the Philistines. And we hear a lot more about the Philistines in the Bible than we do these others. But the Philistines are gone. Anybody ever met a Philistine? Anybody ever, anybody ever shook hands and said, I'm a Philistine? Or I'm an Ammonite? Or I'm a Moabite? Or I'm an Edomite? All these were, they're gone. They were, they were, they were wiped out. They were, they were, they were done away with. All of the land that they, all that land that they occupied is still to this day, it's all desolate land. It's all dirt and sand, and and and, and it, it, it says it's going to make it a place for camels to dwell and for and for wolves and and, and things to run for wild beasts. It's that man don't live there. Man, man don't occupy these lands from that time. These prophecies were all brought about, and they were sustained, and they're still sustained to this day. Because for the most part, that those, these lands are all desolate to this day. They're not they're not occupied. They're all part of Jordan and and other countries now. Because the, all that was assimilated, these people were assimilated into other people groups and, and done away. They were they were done away with. They're gone. They were wiped off the face of the earth, just exactly like God told Ezekiel here that they were going to be. He kept his word. He means what he says, and he says what he means. <clears throat> now, before we go on, turn to Matthew chapter 25, because this is all reminiscent of something else that's going to happen. Matthew 25, we'll read some more. Should be very familiar scripture. Starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with them, then He shall sit upon the throne of His glory. Where is the throne of His glory going to be? In Jerusalem. In the new temple, that's where he's going to see it. This is so. So we're talking. What we're talking about here is after Jesus comes back to Earth. This is after he's back in Earth because when he comes for the rapture, remember you know, he comes one time for the rapture and gathers. He don't ever touch the ground. He don't touch the ground until the second time that he comes, and then he touches the ground and he starts creating all kind of havoc. And he sets up and he walks into the temple and he sits on the throne of his glory in the temple that ain't there yet. On the throne that ain't there yet. The throne that was promised to David all below those many hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So when he comes, it's saying here, he will sit upon the throne of his glory. So he's speaking into his future, telling us about what's going to happen once he returns and sets up his kingdom. Verse 32, and before him shall be gathered all nations. This is not individuals. This is not the beam of seat judgment of Jesus. This is not the white throne judgment. This is not. This is a judgment of nations. Because remember, when he comes back to set up, he is set on his throne and occupy the throne of his glory. It's at the end of the tribulation period. It's at the end of the time when all things are done away with, and he. he this is the beginning of the thousand year millennial reign. This is this is some of the first things that he does once he sets up his kingdom that they were looking for him to set up back when he was here before and he didn't. And so they rejected him. And before him shall be gathered all nations. Remember, that's very important. This is nations. This is judgment of nations, not of individual people. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungry, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? Now, notice what they're saying. They're asking him, when do we do these things? So what does that mean? They have no idea what he's talking about. They have to ask him what he's talking about. He's saying, you did all these things to me. And they're saying, when did we do all these things? Because they're looking at him. They're looking at him eye to eye. They're looking at him face to face. They when do we? They don't realize what he's even talking about. He has to tell them what he's talking about. Because they don't realize it. Verse 39, When saw we sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now, who's he talking about? If you've done it unto one of the least of one of my brethren, who, who is his brethren? The Jews. Israel. He's talking to the nations about taking care of the nation of Israel. He's not talking about himself personally. He's using himself as an example. And he's talking to these people as an example, and he's saying, because the nations, the nations, the people, the nations, the nations of the face of the earth. This is a, this is this is a more in, in, in our in, in, a lot of times I don't we don't play this out in our minds the way it should be, but it's imperative to remember he's speaking to the nations about Israel, about the nation of Israel. He's telling them that they, they're okay and they're invited into the kingdom that was set up for them from the foundation of the world because they took care of the nation of Israel. Because this is the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham thousands of years ago. This is, the, this, is the, this is where it all comes to a point. It's where it all closes up. And the separation of the sheep and the goats and nations. Just like he's judging nations in Ezekiel that we're reading about, he's judging nations. It's the exact same thing. He's judging nations in Ezekiel for not taking care of his. He's judging them because they made fun of. They took pleasure in the fall of the nation of Israel. They took pleasure in the desecration of the temple. They took pleasure in the tearing down and the destruction of the temple and of the city and of the people. That's what he's judging them for because the way they treated the nation of Israel. That's exactly what Jesus is doing right here. He's judging the earth at his return and the nations of the earth for the way that they treated or helped or took care of Israel when? Mainly during the tribulation period because they're going to need help. I'm thinking they're going to need lots of help. We read over and over and over again about how the population of the earth is going to keep dwindling and die off and get killed off. And the nation of Israel is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're going to need more and more because it's a war. It's wars is what's going on. It's wars on the face of the earth that are being fought during that time. Those things represent war. We don't see these. We don't see these prophecies literally the way things are going to happen. I mean, you know, you, you got. Well, as far as I, I can speak for myself, you, you have you have memories of kids of all these different things and these pictures that are all over the internet and. and all around when you was a little kid, the fire and the angels and, the, and all the things happening. <clears throat> but the literal, the, what literally is going to happen, it's going to be wars. It's going to be wars on the face of the earth. The earth is going to be obliterated and burnt up from the wars that are fought on the ground and the troops that are fighting these things. So th this judgment right here is for the nations, for the way that the nations treated the nation of Israel. Verse 41. Then shall he say all them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat, and I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in. Naked, you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and thirst, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as you did it not, to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. 
and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into, into life eternal. Back in Ezekiel chapter 25. So he's, he's prophesying, Ezekiel's prophesying here to these nations, not to individual people, to the nations that surround the nation of Israel. And, and what he's saying here about the Ammonites, that they laughed. He said, you said, aha. They laughed. They scorned. They took pleasure in all, this, all the destruction of all these things and the fallen of all these things. And, these, and, and, and the reasons for these are many. And we can, we can spend weeks talking about the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites and the Philistines. Because, because I mean, the, the Ammonite, a, Ammon and Moab were the sons of Lot. Everybody remember the sons of Lot. Their daughters got drunk. They took Lot into the cave. Their daughters got drunk. Each one of them had a child with got him drunk, had a child by him. That was one of those was Ammon and one of those was Moab. Edom is Esau. This goes, this, the, the, the Edom where we're fixing to read about is Esau. That goes all the way back to Jacob and Esau. Amen. The, the story of Esau, the birthright, and giving him up. And Jacob blessed the wrong one. And, and th th that's where all this hatred and, and guile and all these reasons for being enemy goes all the way back to the beginning. And the Philistines have always been there. Uh, there's more about the Philistines in the Bible than there are about these other nations for the most part because if we, we hear about the Philistines I mean, the, I mean you see on that picture that Philistia is a little tiny place I mean they wasn't they weren't a very big people it wasn't a very big land and there wasn't a whole lot of them but they was always in the mix they was always mixing it up with Israel the, 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 the enemies of it goes all the way back to David and, and even beyond back then the Philistines were always there they were always an enemy of Israel. These, these, these enemies, these, this hatred, it goes way back. And, and, there's, and there's reasons why that they're enjoying, that they're taking pleasure in this. But that don't mean that they're not going to be judged for it. It, 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 it don't give them, that they're, they're going to be judged. They're not going to get away with this. We can't stand around. What, what, what is it? What did God say? To Abraham in the original promise, he said, I will bless those that bless thee, and I will curse those that curse thee. No questions asked. No getting around it. There's no getting around it. If you don't bless Israel, you don't have to agree with everything Israel thinks. You don't have to line up with all of Israel's political stances and I hope you don't. I mean, we don't, we don't have to be, Israel's wrong, Israel, but it don't matter. Israel's wrong about the Messiah. They're wrong about the Christ. They're wrong about the religion. They're wrong about they see th the way they see things politically and spiritually and socially and everything else. They're wrong. Yes, they're wrong. All the bad stuff you hear about the Jews, it's probably right. But the thing is, they're still God's chosen people. He didn't say, I will curse you, those that curse thee, unless they're telling the truth. That's not, that's not what he said. That's not what he said at all. He will bless you if you bless Israel, and he will curse you if you curse Israel. I promise you. No matter what they do, that don't make them. That don't make them. That, that don't mean they're going to get away with anything. Remember all this, all, all this, all this destruction and all these things that are coming. Remember the whole city is going to be torn apart. It's going to be took down. In the end, the whole nation is going to be tore apart. Israel, as we know it right now, is going to be tore all to pieces. And the Jewish people are going to be rendered, and they're going to run. They're going to. They're going to be went through the ringer. The blood, the, the, the blood, the bloodshed, the death, the, all this, all this that's coming. It, don't think they're getting away with anything. It don't matter. It's not up to us anyway. They're God's people, not ours. And just like he said in Jeremiah, that's why I read that in Jeremiah. He said, I made these things. I made this earth. I made these people. I made you. I made all these lands. And I decided who I wanted where. And he's basically saying, this is my, it ain't none of your business. I'm running things the way I want to run things. That's why he says over and over and over and over through the study of Ezekiel, so that you will know that I am God. Because he does not want people speaking for him, doing for him, making his mind up for him. He created us. He created us. How, how, how can we... How can we think? How, how can we process thoughts along the lines of, I, I know what's better for me than God knows what's better for me. 
It's, how, how can we process thoughts like that? He created us. He made us. We didn't make him. We're trying to make him. We're trying to remake him in our image. We're trying to make him be something he's not. We're trying to put him in a little box where he's he's a slave to our emotions. If we think it's okay, then he should think it's okay. If it makes me feel good, then he should be okay with it. If I think, if I think, if I think, if I think, it don't matter what I think. It matters what God said, what God told us. And my opinion matters not. Believe me, that hurts my feelings too. I'm kind of proud of my opinion sometimes. Maybe too proud. But it don't matter. My opinion is worthless. If it don't line up with what the Scripture says, it's, it, 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 it's worth, it don't mean anything. But it's so easy for us to fall into that trap and become one of these nations. Become one of these nations. <clears throat> Verse um, 8. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Moab and Seir, do, and Seir is another name for Edom, uh, say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. Therefore, behold, I will open the side of Moab from the cities, from his cities, which are on his frontiers, the glory of the country. Beth Shemoth, Baal Meon, and Kiriathim unto the men of the east with the Ammonites and will give them in possession the Ammonites that, uh, give them in possession that the Ammonites may not remembered, be remembered among the nations and I will execute judgments upon Moab and they shall know that I am the Lord and they're gone like I said they're gone these nations for, for the most part you, you can't I dare say anybody could go and run a bloodline to a Moabite or to an Ammonite because they've been gone for a long time. These lands have been desolate for a long, long time. These, uh, these cities that are mentioned in verse 9, Beth Jeshemoth, that means uh, city of, of desolation. And Baal Meon means, simply means worshiper of Baal. And Kiriathim means double city or double indemnity or double curse and, and, and those are just those are just cities that were in there it's Ammon and Moab and uh, starting in verse 12 we have Edom thus saith the Lord God because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it. And I will make it desolate from Teman and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. They shall know my vengeance, he said. They will do according. They will, again, here we, ha here we have God speaking of the armies, the, the Gentile armies, the heathen armies, the godless armies doing his bidding. They will show my vengeance. They will do my bidding. They will do what I say. And they are doing it unknowingly. They're not doing it because they believe God is leading them. That's not, that's not what's happening there. God is, again, showing the amount of His control over the people of the earth because His people, us, we think that we don't have to do what He says. So what does He do? He makes people around us do things for us, with us, against us, or to us, and not even know that that's what they're doing. Not even know. He controls that much. He owns everything. He's in control of everything. And the whole earth does his bidding and speaks of his will. Period. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy for the old hatred. Again, all this stuff, this hatred, this enemy, this deep-seated, deep-rooted, deep-rooted hatred and envy and strife and turmoil and war and fighting that's been going on between these for hundreds of years. 
Verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out mine hand upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the Cherethims and destroy the remnants of the seacoast. That, that word Cherethims means literally cutter or slayer. And it's just kind of odd to me there. It says, I will cut off the cutters or I will slay the slayers and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. These nations are not going to get away. They're not going to come off unscathed. They're not going to go away unharmed. They're not going to be enemies of the nation of Israel and get away with it. Nobody is. I will bless those that bless thee, and I will curse those that curse thee. It all goes back to that one, that, that, that first promise that he made to Abraham. He will curse you as an individual. He will curse you as a nation. He will curse you as a people group. He will curse who he will that won't bless the nation of Israel. And it don't, there's, no, there's no provision in there for, for what we may think about that for what I might think about Jewish people, for what I might think about Israel, for what I might think about how fair this is. It, it, it seems to me that, 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 that some people, it seems, I've, I've been told that it, it, it's unfair that, that the Jews act the way they do and do the things they do and get by with what they do, but yet they're still the... the they, they, don't, they don't seem to bother them because they're God's people. They, they do all these things by works. They do all these things by their works. They're, they're, they're proud of their works. They're proud of what they do. Uh, the Israel, the Jews, for the, for the majority of the majority of them are, are atheists. Like 88, they're 88 percent athe atheistic society. There's very few of them that even recognize that there is a God. And and the ones among those who actually have anything to do with him or worship him in any kind of way is a much smaller number than that. And then you've got another smaller number of that that are messianic or believe in Christ or believe that Jesus was the Messiah and are actual Christians. Very, very, very small number of it. But, but still, they're still His chosen people. He made that promise to them. That promise still stands and it'll never change. It will never change. Even to the point that, like we read in Matthew, the first thing Jesus does when He sits down and sets up his kingdom and sets up his throne is judge the nations for the way they treated Israel. Any questions or any comments? I think that's all. I think that's all. Anybody want to add anything? Okay. Just like you said, you know, I didn't think that the Fed's army had a few Fed's Back in Romans, Romans 13, you know, Paul writes, for uh, food is not fair, good for but to the evil. Right. Right. But to the evil, you know, we're going to God. They look at it in that aspect, you know, seeing everything that's going around, those that have that mark in their head. Right. The way that things are going, like they are in the Exactly. We'll see that being a Christian. Being a child of God, you've been sealed with that mark. Exactly. And as that comes back, come down upon this week of work. Just like we've seen in that scripture right there. We can see why the powers are in place today. Before that comes together. Exactly. And it's just, that is what it is. These same nations, I mean, you can go and read Psalms 83, and you can run down these, you know, you can take one of these maps and compare it to the map that's. Uh, a map from today, and you can go in Psalms 83, and you can run down to coming war, the coming uh, Psalms 83 war for the land. You can compare the the lands that are mentioned in that to these lands here, and the same people that are stacked up against the nation of Israel in Ezekiel's day are the exact same people that are stacked up over there right now, including the good old U.S. of A. No matter, I, no matter what we think, it don't matter. It don't matter. It don't matter what I think about. The United States of America. The United States of America is, is wrong. 
they're making bad decisions, they're making bad judgments, and they're putting themselves in a bad, I mean, we're allowing the people that are in charge to put us in a bad place coming against the nation of Israel. And because Joel, when we're studying on Sunday night, Joel plainly says that the land is going to be parted. And John Kerry is sitting right, he's right in the, he's the one with a hatchet in his hand right now, as far as I can tell. And we're allowing him to. And we're giving him great accolades for doing it. We're, you know, we're saying what a great job he's doing. He's bringing judgment on America. Not, not like that we don't have judgment coming in anyway, but we're going to be among those nations who are involved in the parting of the land. And it's the same nations then as it is now. The same God that was God to Ezekiel is the same God now. He ain't changed. He ain't mellowed out. He ain't got old. He ain't seen the hippie movement on the face of the earth and say, yeah, you might, they might have something there. Maybe I should just mellow out and chill out. And, not get so it's not like that that's why he's righteous and just and holy if he said it then he meant it then and if he said it then he means it still now to this day do we live under grace yeah does that give us uh, the, the opportunity to abuse our liberty no no it does not it makes us more accountable than the ones that were under the law because that's all they had they didn't have the spirit telling them what to do, nudging them. They didn't have that small, quiet voice that'll tell you when you're doing something wrong. They didn't have that like we do. All they had was the faith and the written word. We have that. And and, and if, if, if those scarcely be saved, then where do we fall into that category? See, it's not just for the absolutely lost sinner and the holy and righteous one. It's all those, we've got a, we've got a variable there with us that they didn't have, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We've got that Spirit. They didn't. They had the prophets. The prophets did, and they had to hear the voice of the prophets and have faith and believe in what the prophets said. They had to take Ezekiel for his word. They had to take Jeremiah for his word. They had to take Moses for his word. They had to do all of these things. And Moses, even in his day, he declared, he said, there will be a prophet that will rise up from among you and on him, will the, on his shoulders, will the judgment of the nations be. And all men will seek unto him. That's what Moses declared the coming Messiah. But until then, they had the law. Until then, they had to have faith in the written word. They didn't have the spirit inside of them telling them what to do like we do. And we are definitely going to be held accountable for that. Because... Not only do we not have faith in the written word, but we ignored and pushed aside the voice of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that's the only thing that you can do and not get forgiveness for. The only thing. Unbelievable how much, how much, how, 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 how powerful and strong that is, and, and people just overlook it. They just don't care. They just they live their life however they want to. Anybody else? I need to quit talking. I've talked too much now. All right, let's all gather together and pray.